Bienvenidos a la quinta conferencia latinoamericana SBI 21 MX Un evento que reúne a los más grandes especialistas internacionales En IT Service Management DevOps Talent Management Transformación Digital Ciberseguridad Blockchain Y Service Desk Agradecemos la presencia de nuestros sponsors SDI 21MX. El futuro es hoy. Comenzamos. SDI 21MX. Nuestros speakers. Neville Hughes. Con más de 25 años de experiencia en la industria de TI en múltiples sectores, le apasiona mejorar la experiencia y el servicio de los empleados en general. Sus áreas de especialización son la mejora continua, la gestión de proveedores y la gestión de servicios. Actualmente es consultor senior en Cloud Startex. Mark Bewick un líder de TI altamente motivado y enfocado en los resultados con más de 25 años de experiencia en servicios financieros, medios y viajes, impulsado por mejorar la experiencia de los empleados y clientes. Bewick opera a nivel global desafiando el status quo y utilizando su experiencia para encontrar e implementar soluciones duraderas a los problemas. Se desempeña como independent. Hello. Um, hopefully you can hear and see me and you can see the slides. Um, I'm Neville um, and I'm here with my uh, friend and colleague Mark uh, to talk to you about experience level agreements. And we are really trying to look at this from a practical perspective. So to give you things you can take away with you. So a, a little bit about us. Um, I've um, been in technology my whole career, um, approximately 25 years. Um, I spent most of my career in financial services. I have recently moved into consultancy and I'm um, working with a firm of consultants called Cloud Stratix here in the UK. Um, a, a, a bit about me, I, I really firmly believe in championing continuous improvement. So I like to improve um, every day in, in small chunks um, and I like moving the needle. And what I mean by that is I like um, being able to measure progress Uh, and being able to see that um, get better over time. And a very brief introduction to myself. My name is Mark Bewick. Um, I have a similar number of years in, uh, in technology as Neville, 25 years. I do look a lot younger, I know. Um, and I love knowledge sharing. I love doing these types of events and talking to my industry partners and peers. And importantly, I love challenging the status quo and making things better. Uh, I've got a lot of experience in that over, over the years. Back to Neville. Okay, so um, we're, we're going to be talking about a number of things as, as we go along on this session, and, and um, it's helpful for us to, to make sure we're clear on what we mean when we talk about certain things. So, so, so these are our definitions. Um, so, so employee experience, um, that's the, the employee's feelings and emotions um, during the touch point with their employer or their prospective employer. You can see with the graphic underneath there, we've got a, you know, a, a, a standard life cycle starting from somebody um, thinking about joining a firm, going through the recruitment process right the way through to, to enjoying their experience while they're there and then, and then exiting at the end of their career there. Um, so, so to us, an experience level agreement or XLA, as we'll refer to it from now on, is a, it, it can, is quite broad, but you know, effectively it's a documented commitment to an experience outcome or value. And we're going to talk through some examples about how you can use XLAs later. For example, um, when um, looking at employee onboarding or happiness with IT services or happiness with IT support. Um, now, moving on to a service level agreement, which is, you know, uh, typically the, the more traditional way of, of, of measuring or documenting service um, levels. Um, that definition there is the ITIL service um, SLA definition. 
Um, and you, and you, know, you would typically measure things in an SLA through more traditional measures like incident restoration times or, or service availability or um, a change success rate. Um, so we've got a couple more here. We've got in experience management, which is a more um, modern term, I would say. And we, we think experience management is about continually improving based on feedback. And, um, and Mark's going to talk a little bit about how you get that feedback later on. And then finally, the three ingredients of happiness or the three ingredients of employee happiness. So, 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 so as, as Mark and I have worked together over the last few years, what we what basically we've boiled it down to is there are three elements that matter. And if you get those three elements right, employees are happy. If you make them, if you don't get them right, they are unhappy. And again, Mark is going to touch on that later on in the presentation. OK, um, so, so, so net promoter score. So um, we we prefer to use net promoter score when we're measuring employee experience or employee happiness. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a brief primer on NPS. Um, so, so, so when you're asking for feedback using NPS, you ask for a score between zero and 10, where zero is the lowest score and 10 is the highest. And then you classify your responses into three categories. So a score of zero to six is a detractor, seven to eight is a passive, and nine to 10 is a promoter. And to calculate MPS, you are subtracting the percentage of detractors from the percentage of promoters. And that will give you a score of between minus 100 and plus 100. And, and, and historically, where this has typically been used is, is in types of surveys like, would you recommend this service to others or would you recommend this product or vendor to others? But it actually works extremely well in service environments for what we would call a transactional survey. So this is a survey where you're asking for feedback following resolution of an incident or fulfillment of a service request, for example. And, and, and why MPS, I think, tends to work better than traditional CSAT is it moves quickly when things change. So it's you know because you've got that passive section in the middle and that passive section doesn't count towards the overall score. If you If you slightly dip in service, you'll see it reduce, but on the flip side, if you increase, you'll see it, um, it, the service improve as well. And, uh, and we actually believe, particularly when you're working with outsourced providers, using MPS because the scores tend to be lower, uh, you know, a, a, you might get a, a 9.7 out of 10 might translate to a, a plus 80 MPS, for example, it tends to drive higher level performance because the bar is, is set lower. All right, so, so, so now I'm, I'm going to talk about um, how do you create an experience level agreement? Um, this is a simple model we, we've um, devised over the last 18 months or so. Um, again, deliberately simple. So, so, so the first step, if you look at the pyramid on the right, is to start with why. So, so it's really, really important when thinking about an XLA, you're thinking about what, what, what's the problem you're trying to solve by doing it. And, and that really should be from a business perspective. And then you're looking at what are the key outcomes to, to, that you're looking to, to, to introduce as part of, to, to, to get to your why. So really this is about visualization. So what does success look like? What does it feel like when you've got there? And then you wanna decompose your outcomes into your XLA measures. So, it's, and obviously these are important. These are telling you, are you moving towards your why? Are you making things better? And then underpinning your XLA measures, you've got your more traditional operational measures, your, your service level agreement type measures. These are still really important because they support your XLAs. And fundamentally, they are telling you as you go along whether why your XLAs are where they are. And I'll explain a bit more about this in an example in a minute. Um, so we also have, have, have um, conceived what we call the big rules of measurement. So these are things you should use whenever you're thinking about defining an XLA or an SLA or a KPI, whatever you want to call it. So the first one is only measure what you're going to use. So it, you know, it, it will cost to measure something, whether that's human resource to, to um, produce a report or just general noise or even compute power. So if you're not going to use it or you're not going to make a decision as a result of that data, just, just don't measure it in the first place and just, you know, just simplify. Um, then, then the next one's about behavior. So, you know, inevitably human nature, if you set a target, whether that's through a contract or an internal measure, it's, it's likely to drive behavior. People generally want to meet a target. So you've got to be really, really careful when you're defining that measure to so think about 
what behavior is that measure going to drive? And then moving on to the next one, one of the things you can do to help drive the right behavior is use tension metrics. So with what we're talking about here is if, if you're looking for a particular outcome, define a metric that, that drives behavior at both ends of that outcome. And hopefully because you're driving behaviors that or you're, you're setting a metric that would define, define behaviors at either end of that, you're going to meet somewhere in the middle because of that healthy tension between the, the two metrics. I've got an example of that in a second. So the next big rule is review continuously. So I mentioned at the start, I like to, to, to improve daily. So get into that operating rhythm of looking at your reports regularly. Don't just look at them every month. And then set goals that aim high. So um, this is something Mark did really well when I worked with him previously. So, 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 you know, historically, where we've worked previously, you might set a 10% or a 20% improvement target year on year. And, and, you know, what tends to happen is you can generally meet that, but then you might stop halfway through the year if you've met it, or you might not set goals that are aggressive enough. So what we would subscribe to is set a higher target and, and accept you might not meet it. But actually, if you set a higher target, you, you're probably more likely to get a better result at the end if, you, if you're not too worried about whether you meet that target or not. Um, next big rule kind of goes back to the previous side. Make sure your SL XLAs are linked to your business outcomes. And then finally, make sure your operational SLAs underpin your XLAs. Um, I've got an example on the screen here. So this is the pyramid from the previous slide. Um, we've got the Y on the top. In the example here, we want to minimize day-to-day -day disruption to our business from, from technology typically. So the outcome we're looking for is when something goes wrong, we want to fix it first time and we want to fix it quickly. And the way we're going to measure that is we're going to use the, the surveys I mentioned earlier, and we're going to use net promoter score to, to come up with a score we can track. And then underpinning that, underpinning that, we've got some service level agreements or our operational KPIs. And the examples we've got on the, the screen here are tension metrics. So if we want to measure speed, we're going to look at the percentage of incidents that were resolved within the target time. And we're going to measure the percentage of incidents that resolved at first contact. And for accuracy, we're going to measure the percentage of incidents that were reopened by the user, i.e. we didn't get it right first time, and we're going to measure the incident bounce count. And we like to measure the bounce count as the um, total number of incidents divided by the total number of times all of those incidents bounced. And those speed and accuracy measures are tension metrics. So you can't fix it too quickly because you're also concerned about accuracy and you can't take too long because you're concerned about speed. And the idea about those is you meet somewhere in the middle and achieve the right result. Okay, so, so we're now going to um, talk about some real world examples. So we've, we've got four examples where we have used, Mark and I have used experience level agreements previously, uh, and we're going to talk through the types of things you measure and the types of outcomes you're looking for. So I'm going to talk through the first one, then I'm going to hand over to Mark, who's, who's going to continue. So um, just as a recap, um, we talked, I talked on the second slide about definition of employee experience. It, it's the whole, it's the whole life cycle or the, the journey that somebody goes through when they're engaging with and then joining and leaving a firm. The examples we've got on this, these slides are primarily in the joining and enjoying phases. So um, the first example we've got here is about the support experience. So this is about when an employee has to interface with IT support they are getting the best experience they can. Um, so the XLA is employee happiness with IT support. Um, how, how are we going to measure that XLA? So, so what are the, the operational or the XLA measures? So we're going to send a survey every time we close an incident, every time we'll fulfill a request. And we're going to use the net promoter score method to, to calculate our overall um, performance. Um, the next part of the table here shows some example service level agreements or KPIs you might use. So I talked about bounces per tickets previously. Age tickets is really important to understand how quickly you're moving things through the system and whether you've got bottlenecks. First contact fix rate, because generally the, the happier the consumer, the, 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 the uh, so let me say that again, the, the less hops you have in the support process will lead to a better net promoter score. 
Um, we're also going to look at things like the incident restoration time, so how quickly are we fixing things, and uh, on the other side, the service request fulfillment time, so how how fast are we are we servicing those requests? And then I think the really important thing with this is what are we so what are we going to do with all this data? So you know we'll get lots of data, lots of KPIs. We've got our XLA measures on a day to day basis. What are we going to do to to review those, and what actions are we going to take? And, and on here, he, these are some of the things we've done previously that have that have really helped move the needle on on this XLA. So most important thing. I talked about continuous improvement earlier, review daily, sit down every day, whether that's with a service provider or an internal team and, and look at those detractor responses. What is it? What are they telling us? And if necessary, call the, the individual that's right, that's filled in the survey and, and, and really try and understand what's going on. And we also really believe you need to review those passives as well. So those are those scores of seven and eight because those passives can easily be promoters. If you push them up and conversely, they can easily be detractors as well. And you also need to review perhaps not daily, but on a regular basis, at least monthly, sit down and think through why are people scoring us, scoring us nine and 10? Are there in particular areas? And can we learn lessons from those good experiences people are having to drive up those detractors and passives to promoters? Um, Another thing we've seen quite well previously is, is, is to segment your user population. So, for example, you, we've used a tool called Happy Signals, some of you might be familiar with, and Happy Signals allows you to segment your users into various profile or, or, or in personas. And it does that by asking the person a survey every now and again of the types of things they do. So, so for example, a doer normally tries to fix an issue themselves before they contact support or might help other people. And what, what we saw previously with our doers was that they tended to use the portal, you know, which isn't surprising because they want to try and fix it themselves. And therefore, it was really, really important that those portal tickets were fixed as quickly as they can because we actually found out our doers were scoring as a lower MPS than our other users because we weren't servicing the portal, the tickets through the portal quick enough. So what we did is we diverted more resources to those portal tickets and we actually added a field to the ITSM tool to show the service desk who were the doers so we could then put more emphasis on those tickets. Um, another thing we've done previously to drive up that MPS is to shift left or automate. Again, sounds obvious, but like I said before, if you can automate something or fix it at first contact, you're more likely to get a higher score. And then on the service request side, it's really, really important to capture the right information first time. So make sure your forms contain the minimum number of information available, but ensure the right information is mandatory and that the, the way it's captured from the user is unambiguous, because otherwise you end up with, with um, back and forth between your support teams and the users trying to, to clarify what's actually required. And that always leads to detractors. And then finally, again, typically with the service request, set expectations. So if it's going to take five days to fulfill something, that may not be ideal. But in our experience, if you tell your user it's going to take five days, they're less likely to be unhappy than if you don't. And obviously, the overall outcome we're looking for here is, is what we call increased employee happiness. So, so even though an employee is coming to you for a support request, you can make that experience really positive and make them want to come back and, and, and promote you to their colleagues. All right, I'm now going to hand you over to Mark, who is going to talk through the other three examples we've got here, plus talk about um, some best practice around surveying and also talk through the three ingredients of employee happiness. Thank you, Neville. So hi, everyone, again. Um, the first one I'd like to talk about here is one that I was uh, very passionate about, the onboarding experience. So the outcome we're trying to achieve is that all employees receive all equipment and credentials they need on the first day with the company. There is little point in um, giving them a laptop on day five or day seven or whatever it might be. That, I can tell you, frustrates people every single time it happens. You're never going to have a happy start to a career in a company like that. How we do that um, is the survey to the starter, the new, the new employee, and, and the manager also shortly after they join the company. It could be a week, it could be two weeks afterwards, but not, not too long. Let, 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 it, let it take time, not the first day, but, but very shortly after they join. 
Some of the SLAs and KPIs we might want to think about here are fulfillment of laptop requests. So did they get a laptop on, on day one? Fulfillment of user account creation. So were all the accounts they needed created on day one? The last thing we really want is for an employee to have to go and hunt down how to get a laptop and hunt down how to get access to the stuff they're going to do day in, day out. And if they need one, of course, fulfillment of mobile devices. And it's, it's kind of interesting that all of these things, when you get that feedback, you're going to work out very quickly that some of those things are just not optimum. So, so for example, we'll talk about it in a moment about laptop fulfillment. So the key activities you might want to do here um, is automate the creation of the new starter form and prompt the hiring manager to complete it. So I've seen it in many times in the past where a new starter form was done, was created, bits missing, like Neville talked about, make sure every single field is valuable and important and, and just, just right. You don't want too much stuff to be asked for up front. And you don't want to have that situation where the request is sitting there in someone's inbox, but they've missed the email, so it never gets approved, so the whole process doesn't carry on. So I talked about improving the new starter form to capture the right information first time, really important. You don't want to be going back and forth. That just frustrates people for sure and causes delays. Setting expectations, Neville, Neville talked about that a moment ago, especially on requests. If it's going to take a month to get a laptop, let's call it out. If you're having a new starter, it's going to take a month. But you might be able to do things like, especially with what's happened in the world with availability of, of hardware, stockpile devices, for example, in critical locations. We've 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 seen this before in this white glove in board, onboarding team that we, we've set up before, Neville and I, um, to make sure that we were moving laptops around, around countries like the US, we were moving them around Europe, um, making sure that every single manager who's got an employee in the system, a new employee, is getting everything they need. And you can look ahead a few months to make sure you know what's coming up as opposed to looking like the next day it's too late if you're looking at who's starting the next day I mentioned stockpiling and automation of that account creation we shouldn't <clears throat> we shouldn't forget this that that whole account creation especially when you've got complex systems or multiple applications to service that you really want to automate that and get rid of this sort of approval process that just or, or the multiple hops to multiple people to get the one job done slicken that up, make that quick, uh, so you don't have a situation where you've got someone with their device, but no log on to use on it. Of course, the outcome here is less wasted productivity. Imagine the price of every single person's day rate, um, and not only the price, but the price on their uh, perception of the company. Um, you really want them to have a really, really positive first start and day in the company, and you want them to be active from day one. And you'll also have that obviously increased happiness with them if you can achieve that. <clears throat> So moving on to reduce an instance. Now, I'll let everyone into a, the worst kept secret. No one likes an incident, whether that be the employee, whether it be a customer, whether it be a service desk, maybe it keeps them in business. But ultimately, incidents are not good for business. It's as simple as that. So the experience we want here is less incidents suffered by employees, more productivity. So the how is obviously we're going to measure the number of incidents and we're going to reduce it. So the service level agreements and KPIs might be number of instances per application. That's always a really good starting point. Um, look where your big ticket items are. Number of cancelled incidents. Um, we often forget this one. And this also can hide a whole myriad of things um, where, where cancelled tickets are not included in SLAs, for example. We've seen that before many times. So the cancelled incidents waste the person's time that has raised the instant ticket and they waste the people's time that are dealing with real incidents. So let's make sure we, we measure them and find out where they're happening. And of course, ticket aging is really important at this point as well. Um, you, you see situations sometimes where tickets go on for so long that they either just get forgotten about and never looked at, or they just get auto cancelled out after X months time. So, or when people move on to a new platform, maybe they just squash the incidents and move on with a fresh plate. So some of the key activities, identify training needs and that that doesn't just mean the support people that means the employees so we've seen before where you know you can look at your top raisers of tickets the people that raise the most tickets let's go and meet with those 10 people and say to them why are you raising 10 times as many tickets as that person over there let's have that chat and find out if it's a training issue or if there's something they know that's wrong with the system that that needs addressing Setting user expectations on application functionality and performance, really important. We're all used to now coming home from work or going downstairs from work if you're working from home, 
turning the television on, putting Netflix on, and it's available to watch a film in a heartbeat. That's how people now want their business applications to work. And frankly, especially when you've got legacy systems, they just don't work that way. There's very com- very high complexity sometimes where things have to go through a whole series of events. Big orders, for example, might take longer to go from system A to system D through B and C with multiple hops between and multiple approvals. So you need to set that expectation. If an order, for example, has 400 line items on it, it might take five hours. Please don't raise a ticket for five hours because we know it takes this long. Of course, in the background, try and improve that. But, you know, that set that expectation, as Neville talked about earlier. Proactive problem management. Look at the look at those top applications that I talked about before, the, the one, the number of instances per application. Pick your top three and then pick the type five top issues per application and see what can be done about them. Really, really hone in on, on a problem. Don't try and fix everything. You won't. You won't be able to afford to. You won't have the time to. You won't have the... Uh, the, the, the sort of um, the ability to do that. You won't have the energy to do it. Pick pick the big ones, get rid of them. Working groups, I mentioned, meet up with the business, meet up with those people raising lots of tickets, form the working groups so that technology and the business, that wall that was there historically is blown away and, and you're all singing the same tune, talking about the same stuff and keeping them informed about what might get fixed and when. Importantly, the next one's really important, product releases. Everyone knows that the release always deploys all the new sexy stuff and all the bugs and fixes sort of get left behind on the to-do list. Let's start start bundling those in with the product releases. The last two are really important. I've seen this happen before where your support hours might be sort of nine by five, uh, nine o'clock in the morning till five at night. Um, but the business are there 24 hours a day. Um, so if a ticket comes in, an instant comes in or a request comes in towards the end of that day, you're not going to touch it for potentially, what's that, 16 hours or so. Not helpful. If you can, match your support hours with the business hours. And the final one, I know is complicated at the moment, but really important. And I've, we've used this to great effect in the past. Have that how can I help attitude and approach and use the term all the time and co-locate with the business users. There's no point. If you're in the same city, having all of your support staff on the fourth floor when all of your employees and and support colleagues and the colleagues that need your help are on the first, second and third, go and sit with them. Go and go and mingle with them. Make sure they know who you are. But of course, the outcome here we're after is a significant reduction in instance. And I should have added to this greater productivity. And less cost. On to the next one. Laptop experience. So most people, I think, in, 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 in business or a lot of people in business use a device, whether it be a laptop or a pad or whatever. Um, what we're after here is making sure that they're happy with that device, with that company provided machine, making sure it's performant and it does what they need it to do. One way of doing this is not a daily survey to say, how's it going? How are you getting on today? More likely a baseline. So do a, do a scheduled survey at the beginning of, to set your baseline so you know how happy people are in general with their laptops. It might be five out of 10, six out of 10. And then using the information they've given you back and using and, and reading that and analyzing it and, and action it, see what happens every six months. So after you've put things in place, what, what's it feel like now if you see after six months time, for example, and then a further six months, a further six months. But don't, don't badger them every day with these things. These are sort of, every every period sort of six months or so and of course we'll use net promoter score again because it just it works why not some of the slas and kpis you might be interested in um, are number of crashes per device how i mean there's, there's tools that can do this for you by the way you're not going to have a human sitting there looking through it you're going to have tools that probably deploy agents on machines and they can report back how many times that machine has crashed it's hung it's blue screened um, and some, some systems can give you a health score of the device. Again, it might be out of 10, it might be out of five, but they can say this device is performing 9.8 out of 10. And that's generally a, probably a good thing. Whereas if it was five out of 10, you'd be starting to think well, that person might be having a rough time. Percentage of devices meeting or exceeding corporate standards. The corporate standard should be good enough to give your people what they need to do their job. And you'll be surprised if you start looking at this, how many might not be at that standard, might not have the amount of memory that you need or whatever. Uh, percentage of machines running current operating systems and applications. We all know with some of the new uh, modern applications that are out there that there can be umpteen hundreds, if not well, definitely hundreds of different patches or hotfixes available or iterations, minor iterations. 
uh, try and keep the, you know your your percentage of your machines running as close to that standard and and the latest versions as you can. There's no point having a hundred different flavors of the same application out there. You will run into problems and the experience will be worse. So some of the key activities uh, that may help you here, definitely use tools to understand the performance of your machines. You can use your service management database to see how often Fred or Joe ring in, but, but the tools that deploy agents potentially are, are very, very good now. And you, you would use that tool to compare it to the corporate standards. Um, and, and then you would upgrade the machines to the corporate standards if they're not currently at that. Memory upgrades are a really simple thing. Um, I've seen this before where people need 16 gig of RAM and they've got eight gig, very cheap upgrades that can make the person much, much happier with the performance of their machines. Standardize the operating systems and applications. You can, again, deploy that via tools. This isn't hopefully a human thing. Depends how many people you have in your, in your organization. If you've got five, you can go around and do it manually. If you've got 5,000, you'll have to use tools for that. Yeah. Review the resource intensive applications, whether they're standard or not. So some applications just need more memory. Um, some shouldn't even be on the device. And guess what? They need memory. So, you know, if, if, if applications are not meant to be on the devices, probably streaming applications or heavily intensive applications, remove them, get tools to remove them for you um, if, if you can. Automated restarts. We've seen this umpteen times as well, lots of times that people don't restart their machines anymore. They tend to just hibernate them or, or shut the lid down and, and assume that's a restart. They're not, they're, they're not restarting their machine. So you can potentially automate a restart every week or every month to at least get the latest patches and, 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 and updates installed and to refresh everything so the performance is as good as, good as it can be. And the final out activity may be to replace hardware. You know, if, if, if the person's got a six-year-old machine that just isn't capable of doing what it needs to do, Despite everything I've just said, memory upgrades, upgrades of operating systems and applications, you may need to just replace the device. A device, I guarantee, is much cheaper than the cost of someone's wages and, and, and salary. So it's much cheaper to replace a device to make that person happy, productive, and save your organization some money in the long run. Of course, the outcome here is the same as before, improved employee happiness and productivity. Okay, moving on. So if you go on to the next slide, please, Neville. Um, I'm going to give you a, a quick takeaway here. So surveying, Neville talked about it earlier. I've talked about it a little bit. And you, you can definitely get tools to do this for you. But I've given you an example on the right hand side of a very simple mock up email that you could do manually if you if you if you want. I've, I've used this for I forget the number I sent in the past. Neville, maybe 5000 surveys exactly like this. Um, and they work really, really well. And you make lots of friends really quickly. So first thing here. Don't assume you know how your employees feel. I've seen it lots of times where technologists believe we know exactly how they feel because we know our job and we know they're very, fairly happy. You don't know it unless you're asking them. So make sure you ask them. We keep it simple. Um, we keep talking about this. You can start through the simple email template on the right hand side of the screen. It works. I guarantee it. Um, and don't be selective. Don't don't pick your buddies or the people that are generally happy all the time. Make sure you send it on every result ticket or randomly select them. Don't 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 pick and choose what you're sending them on. So don't, for example, if you see an instant that's taken three weeks to resolve, don't don't avoid that one because of that. You need you need to make sure they're all. You don't be selective. Commit and deliver. So I I make a commitment that I read every response, as you can see in the sort of template on the right hand side. Um, I respond to everyone because if you don't, if they see no action being taken from their efforts to give you feedback, they won't. They'll just stop responding, which is the worst case scenario. You don't want that to happen. Automate if you can. Um, use your ITSM tools or other tools. Neville mentioned one earlier um, to achieve greater coverage and take away that human effort from from doing surveys which i it takes a lot of effort but it's definitely worthwhile and, and obviously you make new friends people will get to know you very very quickly if they're receiving a survey from you every single time an instant is resolved or a request is fulfilled so you can do this manually or you can adopt tools uh, I, would, I would advise really do the manual part first that's how i've done it before and move into tools later thank you neville I never mentioned the three ingredients of employee happiness, a term that we sort of coined when, when we were looking at all the feedback in the past we were receiving. And communication, frankly, is, in my opinion, the most important piece, and it is the easiest to get right. And you need to keep it simple. I have seen cases, we talk about instant SLAs, where if an instant ticket takes, for example, three months to resolve, in SLA terms, that would come back as a red SLA, a bad thing. 
However, I've seen instances like that come back and score nine or 10 out of 10. And that's because the communication was great. We let them know up front how long that issue was going to take. We updated the forms, as I said here. You can do that to set expectations if you wish. We talked about that earlier. But what we were doing was making sure at the very beginning of that incident that the agent who was handling that incident or that request would contact the employee, their colleague across the business and say, "I'm my name's Mark, I'm here to help you. And my contact details are these, and you can contact me during these hours. And you can then get that rhythm of communication going around what cadence of communication, what rhythm of communication is needed. You need to keep them updated on progress. And we have also seen this before, appreciate and consider their hours of work. So don't call them at two in the morning when they're asleep on their mobile phone to get to give them an update. It just doesn't land very well with them. We've had some really interesting feedback on that in the past. And then at the end, tell them what you've done, but non-technical terms. No one wants to know about you've fixed a firewall and uh, a server switch port or a firewall service. They just don't care about that. They just want you to tell them they've fixed the problem and you've done it in human terms. And then prompt them for their feedback and, and tell them that you would love their feedback on how you performed. On to the next one, please, Neville. So communication is the first one. Second one, accuracy. Really important that there's no point in fixing anything badly or wrong. You're not fixing anything. You're just going to have the ticket come back or another ticket raised. It's not helpful. So at ticket closure, have the resolver team confirm with the user, not the service desk. Have them go straight to the user and say, is this issue resolved? I've done X, Y, and Z. Has it fixed your issue? Never close the issue without confirmation. Or, you know, we get this as well. It can take, it can, some people just never come back. So use that three strike process. Strike one, please can you tell us if we've resolved your ticket? We've done this, right? you know, X, Y, and Z. You can contact me in these ways. Strike two, maybe a few days, maybe a week later. Strike three, a week after that. And after that, a nice polite message to say the issue has been closed. If the ticket is closed prematurely uh, or wrongly, make it easy for them to reopen it. Don't, don't make it awkward. Um, make it very simple. One click, preferably. And tools can do that nowadays as well. And measure the reopen cases. So you, you might find specific applications or specific group specific agents um, having lots of reopen tickets. There might be a training exercise to be had, or there might be a form that needs updating because the wrong information was given. The agent did the wrong thing. Tooling. So Getting, getting the ticket to the right place first time is really important. Those hops that Neville talked about, NPS earlier, Net Promoter Score, generally speaking, when you look at thousands of responses, you'll see every hop of a ticket drops the NPS score by 10. So if you've got tickets with five hops, you might go from an NPS score of 90, where you've got generally a happy group of people, happy employees, down to 40. So really important you try and get that ticket to the right place first time. Automate that three strike process and ticket reopening. Don't have humans doing that. It can, it can become a very laborious job and something they just don't want to be doing. And again, ensure the form captures the right information first time. We keep talking about that because it's so often not the case. Shift left, Neville talked about it earlier. Automate as much as possible and where it makes sense and deliver as much as you can at first contact. No brainers. These things make a big difference. And third, Speed. So we can't we can't debate the fact that speed's important. We I talked about it earlier. I want my TV to come on. I want Netflix to come on. I want to watch my favorite movie there and then. We all want things now in our home life, and guess what? We want that in our in our work life as well. So ensuring again, we get that right information first time and get the ticket, get the get the get the instant record to the right place first time, is 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 definitely needed. Don't make the forms that people raise overwhelming. Uh, that will just frustrate them and you'll start from a very low score from the outset. Right route the tickets, um, making sure they get the plate in the right place first time. Look at introducing dashboards. You can do this in your tools and service management tools now. Look at bounce tickets that have bounced more than five times, more than 10 times. You might be surprised. I've seen tickets that have bounced 43 times before. So you, you clearly want to have someone straight in on those when they've bounced any more than a few times, really, to, to work out what's going wrong. Your employee experience is suffering every time it bounces. Automation self-service. So the no-brainers here are password resets, access to things they might need, resources stuck things such as a stuck order in a in a in a process from a to d like i mentioned earlier see if you can automate that and move things on without the human even knowing the employee even knowing there's a problem and queue management um don't don't assume stuff is happening because it probably isn't 
um, make sure you're having those daily daily reviews, probably more frequent than that if you can, looking at tickets that haven't been resolved or haven't been updated uh, and get them moving, move them to the right place. And then, you know, make sure they get there in the first time next time. And, and one thing I'm a big, big, big advocate of is banning on hold time. I promise you on hold time adds zero value to the employee or the customer. Um, it, it, you might come out with a green result at the end because you can put a ticket on hold today, open it in three years time, resolve it in one minute. It's a green statistic. It hasn't helped me at all, right? It hasn't helped the employee at all. So please, please, please consider banning on hold is what I would do. Thank you, Neville. So takeaways, let's look at the, the three things we've just talked about. It's all too easy to think all this is complicated. Neville's just shared the fact that the experience level agreement is as simple as making your employees happy and then looking at ways of doing that. So start, be bold, look at the business outcomes you want um, and, and start there. And I don't think, I mean, if, if we all thought this is complicated and you look on LinkedIn, you look everywhere else, there's so much content about this now that it's all too easy to be overwhelmed by it. So start, do something, send those emails out, those survey emails with, with approval, of course, so you don't want to frustrate anyone. Um, iterate, so get and receive the feedback and do something with it. If it's not working, change. Don't be afraid to change. We're never going to get things right first time or hardly ever. And then share. Share the outcome with stakeholders. Make sure they're aware that you're measuring. Make sure they're aware of what you're achieving because if not, what's the, what's the benefit to them for, to, to invest their time giving you information? Thank you, Neville. Is that our last slide? I think it is. There we go. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it gave you some food for thought. Thank you very much, Neville, Mark. This, uh, I, I really think that measurement is a, a strong muscle that we all have to, to develop. It's a, a capability that every organization must, must have. So we are evolving from KPIs to SLAs and God knows how, uh, what we will expect on the future. So we have a couple of questions. We are going to um, encourage our attendees to have uh, more coming, but we can start with some of this. Um, Gerardo Medin Miranda, is there any set or preset uh, XPIs that can uh, we follow there's available in some kind of a manual or some uh, best practices or something that is written? Hmm. So I think Neville will probably cover it more than I. I mean, we've, we had this, Neville and I went out for dinner about three nights ago, and we had an interesting conversation about packaging something up and giving it to people so they can just follow it. And we're working on that. Um, I, I think there are some, some KPIs in here that, are, that we've been through on the slides that they can have afterwards and use for sure. They can use them today. Um, and if they want to, wish to contact Neville and I afterwards, we'd be happy to help. And Neville, you got any thoughts on it? Yeah, absolutely. To all of that, and obviously, some of the you know, like ex support experience or onboarding experience, they're kind, they're probably no brainers that every organisation should consider. I think the other thing to think about, going back to the start of the presentation, is why are you doing it? Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so think about where you are now, and where do I need to get to? Yeah. You know, so for some of the ones we did there were, you know, we had a poor service to start with when we looked at some of those, and it's like, okay we need to make this service better. And if I was still at some of the companies we've looked at this, I would probably do it differently now because they're in a different position. For example, an XLA we've heard can be a, almost like a user journey type thing where you can be committing to, a, to a, a certain experience based on a journey rather than a metric. But it really is about where you are now and you know, where do you want to get to in say 12 months time and then to find something there. And then back to that continuous improvement piece around, well, okay, don't be afraid to say, well, in six months time, we need to do something different now, you know, because we've achieved, you know, the goal we set out to do. We are going to encourage you uh, harder to get these presets of uh, XLAs so we can follow them. Uh, mm -hmm. Joel Beckhardt, thanks you guys with this sample that you're giving us. Uh, I'm having a lot of ideas, resolving issues like reopening tickets that tends to become a means of customer control to extend service or relieve the stress of your operation. 
uh, we transform it in opportunities and oriented actions for better services. What do you recommend or how, how can we start uh, these efforts for uh, improving, adopting first processes, creating areas, functions? Uh, what, what would be the three steps to me, for me to start? Do you want to go, Neville? Yeah, so, 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 so I think it's, uh, it depends where you are, right? So, I, so I'm working with, a, with a, a customer at the moment and, you know, the service isn't, isn't in a very good spot. So one of the things I'm looking at at the moment is the escalation process, for example. There's too many ad hoc escalations that are causing noise in the system and distracting people. So I'm, what I'm working with them, for example, on is getting their escalation process tighter and getting it reliable to the point where users are using it. And, uh, I mean, I think uh, I think more generically, if you're not surveying already, like Mark said, just start. Yeah. Right. You know, j just 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 start sending them out. You, it was painful for Mark when he sent out 5000 emails a couple of years ago, but it worked. We realized it worked and then we invested in a tool, you know, later. So to start most tools can do, you know, can do most of this out the box. Our service now, for example, can do this out the box just through yeah. configuration. So it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just just start. Start getting the, the experience data. You know, what do people think? And then just get into that rhythm of using it and then iterate. I think yeah. I think that's the best advice I can give. Well, but the, I, I the would... key thing is to, to what sorry, Mark, just what you're saying, you've got to follow up on it though. If you're going to start serving people, you have to do something with it. Because if you don't, you'll lose the confidence of you know of your audience. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, no, I I, I would agree with Neville. I mean, we at the time when we started doing these surveys, there was just a general feeling of unhappiness, right? And and general um, complaints about certain things, like things are taking too long. And frankly, all we had to go on was 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 a contract and an SLA, and it all looked blissfully good, right? So, I, I think starting those surveys for me was key. I think that's what started out. Oh, how old how, all of our journey off on this, and um, I would say start there. Uh, but if you've got some specific issues, then then bolt them down too. For example, it might be you were terrible at major incident management. Well, let's look at that as well, right? You can do it in, you don't have to do one or the other, right? You can do several things, but just don't try and do too many things, right? Because you'll, you'll, you'll exhaust yourself. Yeah, yeah. So we could uh, converge in the uh, in a recommendation that first we need to look uh, to our baseline with the eyes of a rookie or eyes of an, a newbie. So um, get all the metrics that we could have and then start looking for uh, pain points, right? Yeah. So baseline will be the first step. Second step, uh, do you agree that should be what, uh, what is my vision? What is my future? And then start looking uh, uh, in, um, oh my God, I forgot the word, um, prioritizing. What yeah. I want to, yeah, yeah, too much stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Well, so yeah. there you go, uh, Joel. Two steps that you could you, you could start first: your baseline. What are the the, the um, right now situation, and then uh, my direction, right? Yeah, and I also like visualization. So to so, so, so sit down and just think about what does good look like? What does it feel like? You know, like you know, it, it, you know, if it's chaotic today. Think about, well, why is it chaotic? What does it look like when it isn't? And try and figure out what you've got to do to get there. If you work see what backwards. I mean, because yeah, yeah, yeah. work backwards. Yeah. Cool. So uh, you guys, we have time for a little more uh, questions. I want you to uh, share with us something that I think is very important. Um, it's, it seems easy to, um, to prepare, to do a questionnaire or some or, or a survey but we always tend to have these biases because uh, we make the, the the questionnaire and then it doesn't work so how can we uh, attain or how can we stop the biases when we are preparing a questionnaire or a survey uh, so that's that's a good one <clears throat> so we the, the 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 one I put on the screen a moment ago uh, for just general employee happiness with an instant handling, for example, 
we had some very very strict rules around the fact that we didn't want to put any color code in <laughs> we didn't want to put anything yeah. so you quite easily see zero is red and, and 10 is green we, we removed all colors um we removed all words around the fact that 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 we were looking for a specific score we even had people when they were when they were seeking feedback telling people what you know that nine and ten would be great to hear and stuff like that or making it green in their text just keep it very very simple they, it all comes back to keeping it simple and just telling them one why you're doing it but don't write war and peace you can't have a, an email this long right with with at the bottom can you give us a score please keep it keep it direct keep it to the point and tell them why you need it and one if you tell people that you want it because you want to improve and you want to help them and you're giving them another way. One of the surveys we used to do had the escalation process at the bottom of it. So if you are unhappy with what's happened, please, here's, a, here's an escalation process. And if that doesn't work, you know, let me know. You know, that, that type of thing. So you, there's got to be something in the, for them to do the survey. And it's always around making their life better. I, I, and I, th I think the other, the other point is you need to get a high level of survey responses you know so, so you know so you know so, so you know you know you, you often see you know people what one of the firms we worked at before we started with only a 10 percent response rate you know on our service desk and the problem with that is you can't you're not getting enough responses to eliminate that bias because you'll often yeah. call someone back say why do you only give me a six and they say oh, i thought a six was a good score <laughs> You know, and and and, and then you, so, but you almost have to forget that type of thing. If you if you you know, we were by doing some of these best practices, and, and that's primarily around making the survey simple to fill in and having the agents ask for feedback when they're closing the ticket. We were seeing 30, 30, 45 percent yeah. response rates on some areas, and that means you're getting far more data, which which means you're focusing more on. Uh, the trends within that data rather than the individual bias if you see what i mean from the tickets so, so that response rate is really important yeah i agree yeah For, i mean the, the other the other the line the sort of the skeptics of all this out there will say that people only repeat report report back when they're happy or they're unhappy right um by getting 40 percent, 35 40 percent you remove some of that conversation right you, you're getting a good broad depth and the other part as well is that was something that was interesting that i recently saw was how many different people are responding so so for example if you're getting 100 responses it's all from maria because maria is really happy then it sort of puts a bad, bad picture of it so but what you do find is well what we found is you get you know say there's 100 responses you might have 40 50 different people responding because you do get more people specifically raising more tickets than others and that's the other point i talked about earlier yeah, one other break. thing one other thing just to be aware of is there are regional differences in how people ah, score so yes, different exactly. countries in the world are happier to northern europe for example where we are is typically the most unhappy set of users <laughs> in the world right you know i think scandinavia is the worst actually but but yeah. northern europe kind of uk france germany is 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 low and you know if you, you can get benchmarks yeah that, that help you identify that you know and, and sometimes you just have to accept expectations lower right yeah. which is that that you know we you, and and actually the more mature the more advanced the more developed a, a, a society is the less the more critical they are with their it Mm. generally so you find places like africa tend to score you higher because they're it's almost like the expectations within that culture are lower because they're yeah. perhaps less developed absolutely so guys one last question and um i hope this doesn't get uh, uh, like a snowball right so mm -hmm. um we are aware that responding a survey is a desired action to, from the um uh, the users. So have you used any of the gamification tactics that would you could share with us? Oh, uh, short, the short answer is no, not personally. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's interesting because one of our previous companies did try gamification on our intranet to encourage not nothing to do with surveys, but we use gamification and we found there's about there's a 20,000, 50,000 people company and there's about 200 people gamifying and everybody else wasn't and it was a global company so so i i'd so, so no the short answer is we haven't we have heard of other companies doing it where you you know the the hundredth survey gets an ipad or something like that I, you know i suspect that probably does work to a degree 
but, but you know with the kind of volume of surveys we want to get back you know 30 40 percent that could could be could be quite expensive you know if you're giving out ipads regular and to be honest i think if you get if you're fixing things and giving telling people you know just just briefly to go back to the the takeaways if you're sharing sharing the results with people that you know and, and making their lives better i think in my experience that it's probably good is good enough yeah 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 so okay just i don't know on another uh, one takeaway from uh, each one of you what would be the future for us uh, expecting xlas so, so <laughs> i would i would say that um I've, I've i've done some interesting linkedin articles on it um i think this overtakes nearly everything else and neville and i at one point in our career were, were half tempted to squash every other sla we had in favor of the xla and it was a step too far i think um at the time um and i think it probably still is because we've realized now that slas are supportive more than the, than the really important they're important but they're not as important as the experience right so i i think that this this has taken a lot more of airtime now than ever before we've we, we saw this three four years ago neville and i at um another event with one stand talking about uh employee happiness now it's on every event right so it's definitely taking full steam we're in quite early with myself and neville have spent years on this now so we're, we're really enjoying this and I, I look now for roles that have this in it um if the role didn't have this in it i probably wouldn't do this role and i, th and I think for me as enterprise service management emerges more, yeah. you know, with using these capabilities for HR facilities, security, et cetera, then the experience management and the XLA needs to apply to all the services applied to a business. So that, you know, that there's a link between employee happiness and revenue and customer satisfaction. Yeah. So happy employees equals happy customers. And you can't just fix that with IT, right? You've, you've got, you've got to look at the, the overall enterprise. So I think that hopefully that's where it will go because I, I, in the in our previous firm the enterprise was lagging behind IT, you know, in yeah. terms of the service the service quality it was offering, which is unusual I think. But in our case, we had thought we'd done such a great job in getting it in a good place. We felt the rest were, were lagging behind us. Yeah, it's it's going to be very interesting. Uh, Neville, Mark, thank you so much. In the name of um, DP Gurus and SDI. We want to uh, appreciate the, this effort. We know uh, it's uh, from uh, the bottom of your heart. So thank you so much. Thank it's, you for having us. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting us. And um, if you want us to come back and talk again, we're very happy to. We'll be thank pleased. You. Eh, muchísimas gracias a todos nuestros asistentes. Eh, recuerden que las grabaciones se irán subiendo paulatinamente a la página de BP, el, a las, al canal de BP Gurus en YouTube, YouTube diagonal eh, BP Gurus. Paulatinamente los iremos subiendo. Eh, agradecemos su participación. Les dejamos la ruta para que nos compartan todos sus consejos. Esto es SDI 21MX. El futuro es hoy. Hasta pronto. SDI 21 MX es posible gracias a CDI 21MX. El futuro es hoy.